Here we go, another great episode of Let's Talk About It. And uh, I got a good friend of mine here, uh, Paul Dunn, who has kind of been notable in uh, kind of like a lot of different avenues in the fashion industry. But yeah, different, from, different areas. Different areas, and I don't want to pigeonhole you into one sort of designer because I, I feel like you're more talented than that. Um, let's just say that as recent, uh the boxing industry i would yeah the, so the boxing uh the outfits and it's actually already been like 10 uh sorry about like eight years but the boxing stuff is probably what brings me the more um current notoriety if you could say right because it's just more i guess more i don't want to say celebrities or boxers that are involved in that industry versus you know somebody getting a wedding dress off of you or somebody getting some custom suits made off of you the boxing industry just gives you more exposure than those type of things would right yeah it, it's it's making the most noise it's making the most noise okay uh question uh shout out to a, a, a few of uh, our buddies out there soa and a few of the people Absolutely. that we work with um but like uh Question in regards to boxing, man. Would you find, do you find that it's uh, the most controversial industry you worked in? <laughs> you know, oh wow. Um, to be honest, okay, so I started in the clothing business in the late 80s, 87. Um, and so it's, we're coming on 40 years and I've worked with some really scandalous companies. Like the first one I got, the first sort of scandalous company I got involved with was a brand called Jimmy Z, which is back in the I remember that. Yeah. Were they a certain, wait, was that a certain Surf, company? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and Ganser is still, I mean, he's still out there. I see that he's like 80 years old now. He's still trying to start another line. And then when I get into the 90s, you know, I met up with Mike uh, at a factory and he had just started Von Dutch and Von Dutch like if you see the documentary like You know, there's three episodes I could only watch the first one before I saw the cast of characters and I'm all fucking triggered again, so um, so I would always say that the clothing industry I could only imagine like um, film and television or banking would be more scandalous than the clothing industry yeah and then you get into box <laughs> yeah you know and suddenly now it's like you know I mean I get it it's part of the game and you know you just watch um, you just watch all the social media stuff and everybody's like calling each other out and you know who knows what Ryan was doing this last time if he's actually just trolling the entire I, world he before. actually Ryan actually fooled I think a lot of people mm. um, I, I was even like questioning whether he was going to win or not to be honest with you i had haney i'm, I'm gonna be honest with you i know a lot i know like a lot of latinos a lot of mexican people are like man why didn't you back ryan i had nothing to do with race or anything it just had to do with you know it's a mental warfare and and also it's a physical warfare and i gotta give him his uh flowers let's say because man he did a remarkable like performance like he he really did a clinic on Haney you know yeah absolutely I mean I, I think at the end of the day like you know when I heard the reports that he'd he placed two million dollar bet on himself and yeah 50 um, you know I mean that's playing a good game I have to tell you I have this I work with this one uh, fighter uh, Tiger and he's out in Ohio so he's three hours ahead of me and um, like literally by round five, I'm like, I think it's Haney by decision. And then I messaged him the next day saying, this is why I don't bet. Because, you know, it's like round 10 happened. It's like MMA, like anything can go. And in the fighting game per se, like anything could go. Like it, it, you could be up one round and the next round totally, you know, the opposite of what your thoughts were. Like. Absolutely. And so, uh, so yeah, the long story short, Ryan kind of surprised all of us. With that performance um what do you find most difficult um with fighters working in the boxing industry not much really um is that is that the most the like, most difficult to be honest is i'm usually the last to know if a fight gets canceled if a fight gets moved or something like that and right. then it's like 
And then, or, or, you know, often I'll have fighters um, or their management be like, oh shit, oops, can I swear on this? Yeah, you can okay. swear. And so it's like, um, the management will be like, you know, we've got a fight in a week, what can you do? And, you know, I do everything. So it's like, I don't know if I should say this, but I, like I can, I've uh, flipped outfits in 24 hours. Yeah, you've just you exposed, know, from the start to, you, yeah. you just exposed your capabilities. Now yeah. people are gonna be like, "Hey, I know, right? Paul, They're gonna give me a two day notice. I need yeah. it in twenty four hours." Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, now, would you call yourself? I've seen a lot of people out there call themselves like the the cutting edge designers, the new age designers. Would you be as prone to say that you're the future of boxing? Um, I don't honestly know what that means, okay. you know, to say you're the future of boxing, you know, um, and I'm not meaning to be dismissive of what I, or, um, you know, who are some of the other makers? There's a kid, a uh, real good, nice, uh, guy, Chris, uh, at SMF. Um, there's a couple other brands out there, Salazar, um, IG Mobi. And, you know, the, at the end of the day, like we're not making... Um, apparel for longevity. So there's no technology involved in there's, these? There's no, you know, it's... it's You're so not building I, an Iron Man suit. Well, well, and like I said, so what, what I'm saying is I don't want to be dismissive and, and in, in this comment, but at the end of the day, what we're doing is costuming. Okay. Right? It's for a show. Yeah. And it's for, and it's, you know, it's not like theater, which I've done theater work, and you've got to make quick release stuff, okay? It's not that. It's not sportswear apparel where you're not looking for how many washes it's going to withstand, how long, you know, how is the color going to stay. Um, we're, we're talking like, I'll make a jacket, and that jacket may be worn for 15 minutes. Hmm. So at the end of the day, we're really just doing costuming. So when you say you're the future of that, it's really the we're all the future of it. Like anybody that's pushing... The, well, theoretically, anything past a day is the future, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's like whatever, you know, the fabric uh, vendors come out with, you know, next month, the latest fabric or, you know, that you build into your design and how you build it into your design. I'll tell you this. I have heard some people out there saying that they're like the future or whatever like this, and yet they use the same design. Right. Have you ever had any designs taken from me? Oh God, yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, I did the the um, uh, Rolly outfit when he fought Gervonta was uh, like this purple and blue and silver one, and then I saw that um, literally that that short um, by somebody else. I don't know who it was. Wow, interesting. Yeah. So it's yeah, there's been a few. What do you want to be known for? I mean, like a lot of people that have like different skill sets um, don't want to be like me myself. You know, in particular, I've, I've done the DJ thing, I've done the radio thing, I've done the, you know, MC thing, I've, I've been, now I'm doing comedy, just a bunch of different things that I, I don't feel like I'm an ace at all of them, but I feel like, you know, uh, I'm capable of doing different things, and when it comes to business, I'm mainly a designer, right? So, you're a designer in a different aspect, right? You're a fashion designer, but it still entails creative vision creative thoughts um is that does the boxing industry what you want to be known for or would you like to be known as just a a, a person that does different things like fashion um like you know boxing you know that question's kind of a double-edged sword because in one respect the boxing thing the the noise that it gets the immediacy of that noise um that um, that helps the brand, right. you know, the Paul Dunn boxing brand. But that's not the only thing I do. And so on the, on the flip side of that coin is like, okay, do I want to be known for all this stuff? Well, okay, but if you're known for all this stuff, it's, it's kind of like it gets lost in the, right. in, the, in the fray. You know, it's like, okay, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here. But at the end of the day, and I think you and I have spoken about this in the past, is, is that, um, you know, as creatives, you have to express it right. and you have to explore and you have to. And so, you know, I've built cars, I've built motorcycles, I've built furniture, I've built clothing, I've done, you know, um, 
oil and watercolor and um, acrylic painting. I've done sculpting. I've done photography. I've been a stage actor. I've been a lead singer. Like, it's just the creative process. Right. So it's that whole sort of jack of all trade master of none except that full phrase is jack jack of all trade master of none always better than master of one mm. and so i never really heard the full phrase i, I kind of know the saying yeah right yeah. and that's why you know people i mean it often gets cut off there and and so my thing is like you know i can't just be pigeonholed into one area but if you're building a brand, and this is for all of you out there trying to build a brand, right? You need to find that one thing and you need to focus on that one thing and, and then start blowing that up in order to be able to sort of expand your, your, your base. What do you want your brand to be known for going forward? Like, let's say, what does 2024, 2025 bring you? Uh, or what's your, you know, your projection for Paul Dunn brand? Well, I, you know, I, oh boy, I'm editing. Um, I have to go back and, and identify um, what the Paulden brand is because right now I'm also developing um, another apparel line. How are you spreading yourself then? <laughs> Jack of all trades, master of none. That's right. Um, yeah, I mean, but I'm focusing on the boxing right now. All right. And so, um, you know, my social media manager just had a baby, but, um, but as soon as she's, um, you know, uh, back online, then we're going to, um, you know, we'll be back on, you know, building that up. So I am focusing on the Paul Dunn boxing. What, where can they find Paul Dunn online? So it will be, the website is in development. It will be pauldunboxing.com. Okay. Um, we're, I mean, we you got, got social, you on Instagram? Yes. Paul Dunn Paul boxing. Dunn. Um, I've got, uh, we'll put the, we'll put the description in the links. Yeah. And if, you know, um, I, I'm terrible at social media. Yeah. I mean, I can do this, but after that, it's like, I can do this. I, I, yeah. Right. I, but after that, I, I, you know, posting and all that, that's, I have this mental hurdle about like, you know, um, content and copywriting and blah 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 so right although i i do have ideas for for a youtube channel as well so you know there well, we go spread myself then for yeah i think you i think you should i think you could uh, actually maybe get some of the people that you work with i mean you worked with some pretty notable people jake paul uh, who are some of the ones you work with um so i did work with ryan for the first four years uh from 18 to 22 uh, I, I've been to Canelo's house, worked with him a couple of times. Um, I worked with both the Paul brothers. Um, okay. I, um, I hope that hesitation <laughs> wasn't too telling. Yeah. Um, I, um, you know, Rolly Romero, um, I've, uh, good Lord, I mean, there's literally been a couple hundred. Johnny Conyers right now. Um, who's doing real well? Um, Sugar Kane, shout out yeah, to Sugar Kane. Man. Absolutely, you know, I, I gotta say that whole um, TKO boxing camp, like yeah. they, they they make winners. Oh, um, yeah. So um, so I work with a few of the TKO fighters. Um, so uh, oh, and I and then there's a couple of Everlast fighters that I work with, um, Ravizi Ramirez and um, Tiger Johnson. Nice. We, anything coming up that, that you're working on? Oh, yeah. And actually, there's one guy, and um, I got to tell you, he's like intimidating as hell. And so um, he's out of uh, Texas. He's uh, bare knuckle. Oh, I yeah. Ike Villanueva. Wow. And, yeah, I've, I've heard of this guy. Yeah. So, and Ike seems like a real nice guy. I've not met him. I think uh, he's got a fight coming up in uh, July. And... I think this is the fourth time. Like Tiger, you know, I've worked with for about two and a half years, and I finally met him on Outfit Ten, wow. and I'm now um, I, he's coming up in, I think June, and and this will be Outfit Thirteen. Nice, yeah. Nice. Well, I think uh, you know we look forward to seeing a lot more from the Paula Dunn brand. Well, you know, it's all that posting, it's all that freaking content, you know, it's like, I got to get that shit out there. Yeah, you got to get it out, man. And I, I really feel like, I really feel like you've been one of the staples in fashion design and one of the um, iconic 
uh, people that have made outfits and I've seen it on the back end of it I've seen all your outfits they're very beautiful I love the fabrics I love the textures I love uh, you know and I've seen you flip them really quick so um, I think a lot of times people don't see what's behind the scenes when these fighters walk out or these designs walk out and mm. they don't really get a chance to know the machine behind what's going on and, and you're one of the major gears in that machine well, when it comes to like fashion, when it comes to boxing stuff, I feel like um, you deserve a lot of credit for even inspiring other designers um, and their designs and, and what they've done. And like I said, not not to say that you know people have, have just straight up you know ripped off your designs, but they have. But uh, you know we we're not going to name no names. But at the same time, you got to get credit for you know when credits do and, and I feel like you, you have a lot of positive and influential things that are coming in the future and people need to know who you are. Paul Dunn uh, boxing, Paul Dunn fashion, Paul Dunn what else? <laughs> well, you know, like I said, the, I, I, first of all, let me say I appreciate you saying that. I mean, I, 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 I just try to speak the truth. That's all, that's all I really try to speak is, is just, I, you know, if anybody that really knows me, they know that you know, I don't fluff stuff up. And I I think, you know, credit is, credit is deserved when credit is due. And, and I, I, feel, I feel that way. I feel like you deserve a lot of credit for a lot of uh, things that go behind the scenes. And man, I don't know what else to say. Well, again, like I said, I, I appreciate you saying that. I, I tend to just sort of do my thing. Right, and I just want to make stuff. That's where that's 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 my you know my jam, whatever. That's that's where I'm you know sort of thrive and and so. But I need to think about the business, and yeah. and and that means social media, and that means get put myself out there, and that means you know like doing this again. Thank you for the for the opportunity because you know doing more podcasts. If there were more podcasts out there that. Um, you know, not just to expose the brand, but just to let people know that, I mean, though I haven't done wedding and I can do suiting, those aren't my strengths, but I have done women's wear. I've done men's wear. I, you know, when I was at Vans, I worked boys eight to 20. So, um, uh, and I've done denim. I mean, I did denim for uh, Von Dutch. I did denim for Fox Racing. So I have a really nice uh, track suit that I w was gifted to me by Abraham, thank thanks Abraham, uh, that you made. It was the, it was a camouflage. The black, the black on and black camouflage. Yeah, and then the detachable hood. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, God. John could have done that, and Jose could have, but, but. Yeah, I heard somebody ripped off that idea, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we know where it came from. Yeah, right? exactly. But, yeah, I know. There, you know, it's the funny thing is like if you really go back into into social media and that sort of thing, you can see documented evidence. It's like when people come out and say like, "Hey, this is my idea." It's like, okay, well, you know, just go back a few years and you'll see where it actually came from. Well, know? that's a thing. That's a thing with social media and like all these platforms. It's like people don't realize that we're documenting ourselves every time. I mean, like there's some people that do that every day. Hey, I'm on the toilet. Hey, I'm on the. Right. You know, and it's like. People don't realize it, but every moment that you do that, it's just easy for the government to say, <laughs> yeah, well, track yeah. you. Right, like, hey, right. you know what? That, everybody's watching. Yeah, everybody's watching. That's This is where his eye... Well, dude, you know, it's like, I mean, I'm of an older generation. Me as well. I'm not, and, and not so, as old, but yeah, me as well. Yeah, and so, you know, when I see these... You know, you hear these stories of like these kids and they go online and they're like flexing and they've got like this stack of, of hundreds or, you know, and, and then and then they get ripped off. And it's like, you know, like how fucking far do you have to go to, to realize or how how much does it take before you realize that shit like that's going to happen if you're going to just put it out there? Well, I I personally experienced something similar to that recently so you're flexing on no no not me i i i, I don't fl what do you have you're like, flex, uh, my, you flex my one bills of, yeah that's my one of those bill. guns shooting hundreds and yeah yeah i wish no but one of my kids uh who's you know young and, and married his fiance looked at social media and was like man how come you can't give me that and he was like well i can't 
you know, I can't provide you. That's just social media mm -hmm. that you're looking at. But that's the problem with society today. The kids today, they, they see what's online. Even, you know, my, my youngest is guilty of that. They see what's online and they're like, I want that. But what people really don't, uh, don't know is like to have that, you need to earn that. It, that's just not given to you. And I think that's the thing with kids today. They just want things handed to them. And it's like, no. You know, I actually, a couple of years ago, I saw a, um, I think it was a TED Talk, and it's this guy, and he's not necessarily a psychologist, but he was talking about, like, um, about that instant gratification and what social media has provided for this generation, these, you know, younger generations. And, you know, the reality is, is that, I mean, we, you know, the old guys can sit around and go, oh, the fucking younger generation, like, they just want everything yesterday. It's like... Okay, first of all, all generations have want that. We just haven't had it on display in our hands every single moment of our of our life. And so it's not honest it's so it's not the fault of the generation that they the the younger generations that they think this way. It's the conditioning that they were raised within. Right. It's well and, that's generational. It, don't you believe it's gen like the teachings of the decade ago aren't the teaching. I think me and Jose were talking about this the other day. The teachings of, let's say, the generation prior are formed from what the prior generation taught them. So it's generational, meaning that my parents taught me a certain way. Right. I teach my kids a certain way. Those kids are going to teach their kids a certain way because of what society has exposed to us. The technologies that have been brought, right? Um, just different ways of parenting, and through that, it's conditioning. Right. You know right, what I mean? Right, it's right. we're conditioning the next generation. Right. Like I'm conditioning my kids' generation. That generation is going to condition their generation, and so we get this generational, different generations teaching different things, and you get to like the fifth generation from your ancestors, and you're like, wow, these kids think completely different than my great-grandparents. I, I think, though, the caveat to this is that, um, is, is the technology side. Technology. And social media. That's become an additional sort of, not institution, but an additional guidance, parental something. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's done an additional, there's an additional sort of conditioning or parenting within that. Right. Because you can, you can teach your kids the way your, um, you know, let's say your baby boomer parents taught you, which is going to have a different set of morals and, and values and that sort of thing. And you're going to pass that on to your generation. But you've also now got this technological social media element ha that's happening at the same time. And you can't be with your kid 24-7. Right. So therefore, that social media technology element is now 50% parenting. Like when you walk into a room of 12-year-olds, uh, even younger than that, let's say, let's say 4 to 12, because I have younger grandkids. When you walk into a room and there's tablets and phones... What's the first thing you see? Um, Everybody's glued to the damn screen. Right? Yeah, right. So, so uh, whether, technological babysitting. Yeah, whether you're what, whether the young ones are watching YouTube nursery things, right? Whether the middle ones are watching social media influencers, whether the older ones are looking for how-to videos, right? It's like everybody's glued to it, and and even crime is different now. Crime, you know, back in the days. If you had a murder or you had a robbery, a lot of times you wouldn't find like that's that's the way the Italian mafia got away with so many different things. They they did a bunch of murders in New York. There was no cameras around at that time. Right. They you, they had to use ballistics and fingerprints, which was an old kind of way. Even DNA technology wasn't around then. So now we have DNA technology. We have IP pinging off the towers. We have um, you know tracking on you know Google tracks you now. Yeah, I, I don't know if you knew that or not, but you sign up for Google when you get a new phone, that tracks your locations right. as you go in. So, right. long story short, where technology has changed the way. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, okay, let's uh, put it back to fashion. So you're familiar with fast fashion, yeah. yeah. Your your fashion novas, your H uh, and M's, and that sort of thing. Okay, 
The unfortunate news, and by the way, one of my other things that I um, have done, I taught at the Fashion Institute downtown for 22 years, and wow. and um, and I still teach a class here and there, and um, you know, but I grew up in a, I, I always say I grew up in the industry because I was in my early 20s when I started, I think 21, and so, um, okay, well that whole game's changed. Yeah. Right. Like you, you can have one barista with one opinion affecting because they're an influencer. They're affecting the minds of, you know, all their viewers. And suddenly the, this one barista is now making or breaking, you know, brands because they said oh, their garment was shit or their garment was great. Yeah. And so um, so now let's talk about the fast fashion, right? The fast fashion, because of technology, we've now sped that up. Like when I was at Vans, you know, we did four seasons a year. We would, you know, we had our spring, spring two, fall and holiday seasons. And then and I had development windows of like 62 days. Wow. Okay, then then upper management came down, you know, the head of uh, VF, Vanity Fair said, Okay, you got to cut that down 30% to 42 days, which was like, oh, fuck, you know, so like I had to like start really hatching, uh, hatcheting away at the development process and make sure that my supply chain was, um, you know, they had to be more on target the first go. And so, well now, and that's on four seasons, 42 days development. Now we've got fast fashion companies. I'm doing four seasons at Vans, and now fast fashion companies are doing 12 seasons a year. Wow. Each, each month is a new season. That's crazy. So they own their own supply chain. They own their own, which is manufacturing. They own their own logistics. They own their own retail. So therefore, the, the buying process for their stores is similar to um, what, what has happened with other buy stores, you know, like the buyer from Macy's or Nordstrom. Um, but because it's, you know, Fashion Nova product or, or H&M product going to H&M stores, um, they can control the supply chain a lot quicker. So they own the res they often own the resources too. Who's making the fabric, who's cutting the fabric, who's sewing the fabric, who's dyeing the fabric, who's, you know, shipping the garments, like their, their hand, they own all of that. So they, excuse me, they can, they can streamline a lot of it. It's control. It's, it's complete control. It's what we call vertical manufacturing. So, okay, but the problem is that because that, we would mark goods up from first cost, what we actually spent for the product for this jacket, it cost me $10 to make. I would, in, in traditional ways, I would sell it for $20 to the retail buyer, making $10 on my $10 investment. They would put it on the floor for $40, making $20 on their $20 investment, okay? What fast fashion has done is they make it for 10, they sell it for 20. And that's it. And that's it. So like the rest of us who go through these sort of typical uh, wholesale channels, we're competing with brands that are almost, I, I, dare I say, equal in quality. They're not, but we're, 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 we're up against other brands that are literally charging half of what they should be. Do you feel that waters down the creative process as, as well? Like being that you have to be rushed to come up well, with yeah. it? Yeah. Well, yeah. You, I mean, you know, we're, we're, the West Coast has, I think, very much become a, a, a hoodie and t-shirt. Um, right. You know. Yeah, it's a lot of hoodies and t-shirts going yeah. on here. Oversized tees and... Well, but my point to all this is that because the price is so low now we're, well, if we're only spending $5 for a t-shirt, fuck it, I'll just buy all five. If I only wear two of them, I'll throw the other three away. What's the result of that? All that stuff goes into landfills. Right. So the garment industry has now surpassed the oil industry as the planet's number one gross polluter. Wow. So, Shout out to uh, US again. <laughs> <laughs> We're yeah. number one. Yeah, yeah there's yeah. Our, they're, a, they're a company that actually bought or has these bins around the like state and people donate to these bins and what they do is they get that, they they put it in these um, you know, bundles and they uh transport them to different countries. Hey and, yeah, and they they sell them. So it's kind of like recycling in a sense that we're taking garments that are the, you know, 
that are perfectly good garments and, and TVs and, and th not TVs, I'm sorry, garments and um, selling them to other countries to recycle. Yes. The problem with that is that we're producing so quickly because of fast fashion that it's just becoming gar our garbage now is piling up in other countries. What's the answer to that? The answer to that, unfortunately, is that we need to re-educate uh, and rethink how we consume. Mm -hmm. How we, are as consumers, buy garments. We can't think of a garment as... But do, you, but do you really feel like that's a realistic approach? Because I don't think you can go backwards, uh, right? With, 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 well, with then, thinking, right? It's hard to get people to turn back the clocks on the way they think. Just kind of like that. Just kind of like the talk we're having earlier with generational, you know, discipline, generational upbringing. I, you know, Mark, I, I, you're right. You're absolutely right. And can we go back? I don't know. I uh, let me put it this way: Before I left Fitum, I left Fitum in, in uh, December because they're basically out of business now. They've sold to uh, Arizona issue. And this last uh, generation of students, there is a significant portion that are more concerned with upcycled product. They're concerned with um, environmental, uh, you know, the environmental effects of our industry on the planet. And so, you know, that to me is kind of like a distant beacon, but it's a beacon, you know, of hope. Um, but. You know, I don't want to just sort of throw my hands up in the air and say, fuck it, guys. I'm like, I've got maybe 15, 20 years to go. It's all on you now. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so that's why when I'm in class, like I, I usually preface my class by saying, you're not going to hear me talk well about fast fashion. And unfortunately, if ever I see a, you know, a student wearing a garment or something, I'm like, wow, that's a nice shirt. And it's like H&M. I'm like, fuck. You know, it's like they've got some decent design. And that's the problem. If Sheen is problem. You know, Sheena's now got a category, it's festival wear. It's fast trash in festival wear. Hashtag fast trash in. That was, that was mine and, you know, anybody that tries to steal it in the future, you know. You, you just to just let you know, we're down to the main camera. Oh, so we're going to have to start okay. closing up pretty soon. But, okay. but on that note, summarize what you think the answer is. I can. I, I, you know, summarize what I think the answer is. Let's rethink what fashion is. Let's think what re what clothing is. Bella Hadid just did, just did a runway show with a spray on dress. Okay, so what happens is they literally sprayed it onto her. It dried, and then they cut it in different ways, and then she w walked down the runway. Wow. And then she could pull it off at the end of the night, and it becomes biodegradable if it goes into a landfill. And so my thing is like. So your answer is spray on dress. Uh, I mean, that's usually what I go for, but then again, I, I can't go out and cross it that way. So, um, I just do the runway in my living room. Uh, but the, um, we have to think about more sustainability and we, unfortunately, I say unfortunately because it's the challenge. We have to rethink how we consume. True. You heard it here first, Paul Dunn. Man, it's, it's been a pleasure to have you, man. And, uh, we gotta do this again. Um. And we look forward to the future with your brand and looking, you know, coming soon. Yeah, looking forward to new fashion designs, new, seeing the boxers out there wearing your gear. Sancho Loca Show, let's talk about it. You hear it first. Peace. Bird.